Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh. Wow. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Oh, my God. Thank you. I'm excited to see you, too. Hello. My name is Sasha. I'm going to perform for you tonight uh, in English, obviously. So now we'll do some crowd work. But I should warn you that uh, even when I perform in Russian, uh, which is my mother tongue, I'm not very good at crowd work. And in English, it might be a complete disaster. Uh, but good news is that uh, there is no pressure, though. So if I start talking to you and you don't want to talk back, you can just say no. And then <laughs> we stop the show and... Uh, <laughs> We go home, and next year we meet here again, and by that time you will have already begun through therapy, and uh, we can continue the conversation. So the first question that I want to ask is clap, please, if you do not speak Russian. Please clap if you do not speak Russian. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. I'm so excited uh, to see all six of you tonight. <laughs> it is so nice to know that my audience expands every year <laughs> by six people. I feel very optimistic about the career that I have. And we all understand that all six of you are my main audience members for tonight. You're the very reason why I even started performing in English. And we all understand that the rest of them are just here to support us seven in this crazy <laughs> experiment. <laughs> Thank you. So I will start by talking to these people, but feel free to stop me if you don't want to talk. Okay, so this person over here, the first row, hello, what is your name? Tim. Tim, okay, uh, clap for Tim, please. Thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you, we're so excited to see you. So Tim, uh, can I ask you, uh, uh, how, is, uh, how, how is it going? <laughs> It's good, yeah. Yeah, I told you I'm not very good at crowd work, so these are usually the questions that I ask, you know. You have these professional comedians on Instagram, usually they ask you what's your profession, and you're like, I'm a programmer, and they're like, uh, go fuck yourself, you know. I'm, I'm not that professional yet, so these are the questions that I usually ask. How is it going? How's the weather and stuff, yeah. But anyways, Tim, uh, can I ask you what's your profession, though? <laughs> You're in marketing. Wow, that's uh, I can't handle that conversation, <laughs> unfortunately. That's uh, it's hard for me to do crowd work in Europe because people usually have this uh, smart, complicated professions, you know, like programmers, uh, marketing, and stuff. I really miss the good old days when I started out ten years ago in my small hometown because people there they had simple professions. It was so easy to do crowd work. You ask a person what's your profession, and they're like, "Well, uh, I'm a bus driver," and you're like, okay, that's gonna be easy. I know buses. <laughs> and then you can ask funny questions like, uh, do you like wheels, you know? <laughs> And then I moved to Moscow to become a professional comedian, and it, it became weird. I remember my first show in Moscow. I asked the person in the audience, what's your profession? They said, HR. <laughs> and I swear to God, to this very day, I have no fucking idea what HR means. My theory is that HR stands for horrible rich. That's what I'm thinking when I hear that. Here in Europe, it's just impossible. Last year, I had a show in Austria. I asked a person, what's your profession? They said, well, actually, I'm engineering these turbines for these ecological electric wind generators. And I was like, do you know buses by any chance or some shit like that? Because it's too smart for me. Yeah. <laughs> Excited to see you anyways, and that's by the way how I do crowd work. It's not really crowd work It's like an imitation of crowd work <laughs> Where I ask a question and then I do a prepared bits about professions <laughs> Regardless of an answer that I get <laughs> The worst case was in Budapest recently. I asked the person what's your profession? They said I'm jobless and I was like That's a smart profession uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> because I cannot improvise in English, you know. In Russian, I improvise a lot. In English, I'm not fluent enough to improvise. And it feels like a curse, because I still have this comedic skills. So sometimes I come up with a joke right on stage, and I literally cannot pronounce the joke. But you can see sparkles in my eyes. That's how you can tell that this baby is improvising right now. Whenever I'm like, oh, marketing, cool. <laughs> Okay, so I think that I saw another person somewhere over there, right? Uh, yes, yes, hello. Uh, what is your name? Julius. Julius, clap for Julius, please. Thank you, Julius. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So can I ask you, Julius, how did you find out about that show? Your girlfriend, okay. Hello, girlfriend. <laughs> uh, what is your name? Anna, clap for Anna, please, Anna, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, at this point, it's already my 31st show in English, and the statistics by far is that that's the only way I get new audience members. <laughs> is because of them girlfriends. And I am very grateful to the community of girlfriends for expanding my audience. But also, to be honest, I feel a little bit sorry for people like Julius because I can only imagine how hard it is to have this partner that one day comes up to being like, oh my god, you won't believe that! My favorite comedian finally performs in English, so we have to go to share this wonderful experience periods together and you're like well uh, Anna I'm not sure maybe you should go by yourself no we have to go together and then you get here and you see this person on stage being like I'm not very good at crowd work and you're like wow comedy in Russia is shit if that's their best comedian, I wonder how shitty others are. Can they even hold a microphone? Are they even able to speak? Yes, but uh, of course, I'm very excited to see both of you. Give a round of applause for this wonderful couple, please. Yes, yes, cool, cool. So I think that this crowd work has just uh, reached its peak and it won't get any better. So now I'm gonna share the basic rules, very simple, please do not talk to each other during the show. It might be distracting for others and for me included. Don't yell out anything because it might completely ruin the show. But if you hear me struggling to remember a word in English, you can yell out words. <laughs> that you think will fit in. That's a small interaction for today. Yeah, now I'm gonna slowly transfer to the material and uh, I'm so excited to perform in Berlin finally because I live in Berlin myself and because of that I have a lot of jokes about Berlin and Germany in general. Whenever I perform outside of Germany, people don't give a fuck about that material, so I'm <laughs> very excited. But I cannot replace 10 minutes about Germany with 10 minutes about Slovakia, so... <laughs> I have to do it usually, and here it's finally relatable. I want to start with great news, because recently they finally approved my German freelance visa. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm so excited. Such a big accomplishment. And I don't know if you're aware of that, but when you're applying for the freelance visa of Germany, they ask you, what's your profession? And I said that I'm a comedian, because that's the only thing I do. I don't do anything besides comedy. And can you imagine that? They actually wrote comedy on my residence permit, that's insane. Germany is the first country in the world that officially recognized my talent. I just can't believe that. 10 years of doing comedy in Russia professionally, not even a nice word. 11 months in Germany, already critically acclaimed. Wow, that's insane, not even speaking German. But then they said, but remember, from now on, you're only allowed to do this particular job in Germany. If you do anything, besides comedy, you will get deported back to Russia. <laughs> so now I'm very scared every time people don't laugh at my jokes because I'm afraid that there might be an undercover migration officer in the room who'll hear the silence being like, aha, gotcha! That was not a joke, technically! Nobody laughed! That was not comedy! That was all tragedy! <laughs> which is a completely different profession. You are not allowed to 
do tragedy in Germany. We've had enough of that. So, and then they told me that they would send me the residence permit by post in two months. And I waited for two months. And of course, it never arrived. And I decided to contact them. And I realized that the only way to contact them was by fax. <laughs> Now, I am 29 years old. I have never used fax in my whole fucking life. The year I was born in 1994, I was already like, I'll never use fax in my whole fucking life. <laughs> but here I am in Germany in 2024 and I have to learn how to send these fucking fax messages. That's what I like about Germany, that it forces you to master new skills, to become a better person. That's very <laughs> sweet to us migrants. And I know that you might laugh at that, but actually Germany is trying its best to digitalize. How do I know that? A friend of mine recently told me that there is an actual app for fax messages. Can you imagine that? <laughs> they were so close to digitalization, they just couldn't resist sending them lovely fax messages to each other. They were like, and now we create the app for fax messages. Sorry, we tried our best. We just really love paper. So I'm thinking that if Germany ever invents teleportation, they will use it to teleport letters, I guess. That's what is going to happen in the future. And of course, I learned German. I already know the basics. I know hallo, uh, which means uh, hello. <laughs> I know danke, bitte. Recently, by the way, I learned tschüss. Uh, because before that, I used uh, Auf Wiedersehen. And then they told me that uh, only Soviet spies speak like that. So, yeah, I had to switch my tactics. Not to blow my cover yet. Yeah, very weird when you go to a store to buy cigarettes and then you're like, Auf Wiedersehen. What are you, the president or what? So formal, yeah. Also, I'm learning more about German history. I learned that in November, they have a big day for Germany, the 9th of November. I don't know if you know about that, but actually a lot of historical events happened on the 9th of November, just different years. For example, in 1918, the Weimar Republic was established on the 9th of November. Then 20 years later, the horrible event happened, the Crystal Night. Also, the 9th of November, the same day. Then in 1918, 89, the Berlin Wall fell down on the 9th of November. So basically everything happened on the same day. And I thought to myself, that is so German of them, right? <laughs> so well organized to keep all the history on one day. So you have the rest of the year free to send fax messages. That's very clever, so smart. Yes, also very convenient for kids because they ask you what happened that day and you're like, well, basically everything. Everything that ever happened in Germany happened on the 9th of November. You can imagine any event. That was on the 9th of November. <laughs> So recently I was in Sweden, in Stockholm, and what I usually do after shows, since I travel by myself, it feels lonely. So I try to hang out with audiences after shows, and I stayed after the show in Stockholm to hang out with people, and of course, everybody went home. But... <laughs> There was just one guy who stayed as well. He invited me to a bar. I didn't know that guy, so it was a little bit dangerous, but I was more lonely than scared. So we went to a bar, and he turned out to be a very interesting person. So that guy was actually from Kazakhstan. He lives in Sweden, but he doesn't speak Swedish. And the problem is that he has a small child, and his child only speaks Swedish, so they cannot communicate with each other. And I imagined how tough it would be for this child as a teenager because that teenager would always complain, oh, my parents do not understand me. <laughs> And other teenagers would be like, yeah, parents suck. 
And that teenager would be like, no, I mean, they literally cannot speak my language. And you know, when I lived in Russia all my life, I thought that I didn't want to have kids there. And if I moved to Europe, I would have a kid here. And now when I finally live in Europe, I realize that I don't want to have a kid here even more because for some reason, that perspective scares me so much to have a little person at your apartment running around speaking fluent German. Are you fucking kidding me? Every morning you wake up here and ah ha 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 but I think that the advantage is that you can ask your kid to help you at the migration office, right? So you send your kid before you so they can speak fluent German with the officer. You're just waiting for your papers to be ready. And then your kid turns to you being like, we've decided to deport you. House lander. Choose. And you're like, okay, that means bye. Okay, I know that. That's uh, very fortunate. Yeah, so I think that if you have uh, friends or family members who stay at home, uh, sometimes they think that your life in Europe is way fancier than it really is. My life is not fancy at all. Actually, the fanciest experience that I've had in Europe happened to me just recently. So a friend of mine who is a British comedian, and it's not necessary for the story, I just wanted to say that phrase that I have... <laughs> A British friend. So uh, she invited me for lunch. And we went to this fancy restaurant that was unfortunately fully booked. And they told us to wait outside for 45 fucking minutes. We were very upset. But while we were waiting outside, the waiter came outside too. And he offered each one of us a glass of Prosecco. And I was like, no, it's noon. I don't want to drink Prosecco yet. And he said, no, it's for free. And I was like, give me all the Prosecco that you have in store. <laughs> and I was standing there drinking Prosecco at noon for free, enjoying this wonderful European scenery. And I thought to myself, well, I guess that must be how my mom <laughs> imagines my life in Europe on a daily basis. <laughs> Just me standing there, drinking Prosecco, reading a newspaper, waving at my neighbors. Hello, Julius! <laughs> oh, the stock market is insane! <laughs> So another occasion when I thought about my mom happened to me in Munich before the show I went to a burger place and the service was actually so fucking bad. I was waiting for so long. They forgot to bring the drinks. The food tasted like garbage. And after that I came up to the waiter to pay and he said, you know what? I'm actually so embarrassed about the service tonight that I don't want to charge you for that. So you know, tonight it's for free. You can just go. And I was so surprised, and I immediately imagined my mom uh, in Pavlovsk, uh, talking to her friends, and them asking her, how is Sasha in Europe? And her answering, oh, it's wonderful, wonderful, yes. Drinking Prosecco, yes. Reading the newspaper, yes. By the way, food in Europe, it's free, yes. <laughs> Yes, the service is very bad, <laughs> but it's free. You know, you remember we tried to build something like that in the past, and yeah, we failed, but they've succeeded, I guess. It's bad, but it's free, which was uh, the slogan of the Soviet Union, I guess. <laughs> So sometimes I encounter experiences in Europe that I'm not ready for and my brain doesn't know how to react. I was in Denmark recently in Copenhagen and after the show I went to the hotel. Before going to bed I decided to smoke a cigarette outside and I was the only person on the street. It was dark, it was cold, quite foggy, raining, it was windy, so quite mysterious. And then all of a sudden I saw another person from afar just standing there, not moving and looking 
looking directly at me. And we had this weird distance between us, you know, that was not close enough for us to interact, but it was also not far enough for me to ignore that person's existence. So I was just, you know, standing and like doing these gestures that you do when you want another person to know that you know <laughs> that they're there, you know what I mean? <laughs> when you're standing and you're like, oh, <laughs> This mumbling sounds, you know, Copenhagen, you know, uh, quite mysterious. Whoa. And then I saw that person standing there looking at me and doing that. <laughs> and I had never seen anything like that in my life before, so I didn't know what to do. And I, I swear to God, I, I, like, I honestly asked, do you want a cigarette? Because I thought <laughs> that that was a Danish gesture for a cigarette. And I was so upset to disappoint that person because I didn't have such a big cigarette to smoke it like that. <laughs> and I could only give them five cigarettes to smoke like that at the same time. And then they said, no, a blowjob. Do you want a blowjob? And the problem is that my mom raised me as a very polite and nice person. Person. And I didn't want to have a blowjob because I was so tired and I didn't have an emotional connection with that person. But I also didn't want to hurt that person's feelings, so I didn't want to be that rude person. You know, no, get the fuck off me, you pervert! So, and to be honest, I was touched as well because it was so nice to know that this person was going somewhere and then they saw me and they got so fucking attracted, they canceled all their plans and they're like oh my fucking god do you want a blowjob right now so what i said was oh thank you no sorry not tonight but maybe next time because i wanted that person to know that there is still a possibility for us to bond over a blowjob in the future. And also, I know that it's gonna be a very simple and dumb joke, but to be honest, my penis is so small that this gesture doesn't connect in my brain with a blowjob. And I would understand that way better if they said, do you want a blowjob right now? <laughs> And I would be like, oh, a blowjob, thank you, not tonight, yeah, maybe next time. So sometimes I talk to my Russian-speaking friends about sex, and they're saying they, uh, that they don't like doing a dirty talk during sex in Russian because it feels rude and unnatural, and they prefer doing a dirty talk in English instead because it's sexier and more flexible. And I think that to me it's the opposite because uh, I'm not that confident in English yet, and I just can't imagine myself having sex with another person being like, okay... So, <clears throat> who is bad? <laughs> okay, Sasha, let me tell you who is bad. <laughs> Your English tutor is bad. That's who is actually the worst person on the planet Earth. So I've been telling this joke for a while already, but it was only recently when I finally had my first sex in English, and uh, I was very anxious, and at some point I wanted to ask the person if they want me to choke down, but I forgot the word choke, so what I said was, uh, do you want me to... They were like, I'm not sure <laughs> that I want to be uh, murdered, I guess. <laughs> Can we just continue to have sex, please? And when the sex was over, I wanted to show my appreciation, and I only know four ways to do that in English, and I used all of them to make sure that the person understands how grateful I am. So I said, thank you, uh, I appreciate that, uh, much appreciated. It means the world to me. Do you need napkins, by the way? Actually, I know five, yes. 
I think that this accent that I have is not sexy, you know, because there are sexy accents, like uh, the French accent of English, quite sexy, the Italian, uh, the German accent I find very sexy. But I have this Eastern European accent of English. I'm not sure if it's a uh, sexy to hear during sex. Uh, Do you want me to slap you right now? <laughs> Or will you pay the debt that you owe me? <laughs> I've already burnt your stroller. And so It's very hard for me with them languages, you know, because as a kid I had a bad education. I come from a small town. But I have a friend from this very small town who now lives in New York City. Can you imagine that? We're alive, right? So this friend of mine recently found out that I perform in English these days. And he told me that uh, he could fix my accent. Uh, well, actually, he said, uh, I can fix your accent. And I was like, no. I think I'm fine. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm fine with people thinking that I'm from Czech Republic. That's fine by me. It's better than to be from Russia these days, you know. Yeah, of course, these days, whenever people ask you where you're from, if you're from Russia, you feel uncomfortable to say it, and I understand everything. But luckily for me personally, during my immigration, I have already switched three countries to live in. First, when the war in Ukraine started, I went to Georgia. Then I lived in Estonia for a year. Now I live in Germany. So luckily for me, whenever people ask me where are you from, I have uh, where to step back in this dialogue. Like, they ask me where are you from, and I'm like, Germany. And then they're like, yeah, but originally, and I'm like, Estonia. <laughs> and then they're like, yes, but before! And I'm like, okay, okay, honestly, Georgia. <laughs> And then people leave, uh, not even knowing that they almost reached the most interesting part of that conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how it feels for Ukrainians, of course, but my personal experience is that I've been thinking about the war every day of my life. That's the context that never goes away. Because of that, I might get triggered very easily. Uh, the other day, I went to a museum with a friend of mine who is Ukrainian. When we got to the museum, the manager asked her, where are you from? She said, Ukraine. And he said, oh, then you get a free ticket as a refugee. And then uh, he asked me. <laughs> Uh, where are you from? And I was like, I'm so not having a free ticket right now. <laughs> so what I said was Germany, uh, which was weird because we were in Germany. And I do not sound or look German. So he said, oh, Russia then. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, of course, that didn't happen. Uh, honestly, I said, uh, well, I'm from Russia, unfortunately. And he said, oh, if you're from Russia, you will have to pay. <laughs> And now I realize that it was about the ticket that I had to pay for the ticket. <laughs> But since I've been thinking about the war all the time, For a moment, I was like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> And I guess our kids, too. <laughs> That's going to be a long set of historical consequences for all of us. <laughs> And he was like, what? <laughs> And I was like, sorry, here's my 10 euro for the ticket. <laughs> didn't mean to bother you, yeah. It feels weird, you know, because uh, back home all my life, people used to tell me, uh, get the fuck out of here, you know what I mean? Get the fuck out of here. We don't want you here, so get the fuck out of here. We don't like you, so get the fuck out of here. If you don't like it here, get the fuck out of here. So I got the fuck out of there. <laughs> And here, surprisingly, sometimes you also meet people telling you to uh, get back. Get back. We don't want you here either. Get back to your fucking Putin. So sometimes I wonder, uh, where the fuck should I leave them? Uh, maybe in duty free or uh, uh, in neutral water, something like that. 
But I'm so proud of myself because recently it was the first time in my life when I finally realized that I'm not Russian anymore. And what happened was that I was going to bed late at night and all of a sudden I heard drunk Russians yelling outside very loudly in Russian. So what I did was I opened the window and I yelled, uh, Russians go home and I closed the window. <laughs> And I was like, finally, I'm not one of them anymore. It's over. I'm a European. And then I heard somebody knocking on my door, and I opened the door, and they gave me the residence permit. That was how I got it. And yeah, you might also use that trick. That's very helpful. So one of the reasons for me to perform in English is to uh, attract new audience members, which is very challenging for me because I still exist inside of this Russian-speaking cultural context. And for people outside of this context, it's hard to relate to my material. But I decided to keep on doing this material because it's like, it's for now, it's who I am. It's important for me to stay authentic, to stay sincere. And what I decided to do instead uh, was to, before every joke like that, to give you a the necessary context uh, to laugh at that joke. So now I'm going to do several jokes, and before every joke, I'm going to give you the necessary context to enjoy that joke. So when the first one will be about that recent uh, terrorist attack that happened in Moscow. It was brutal. If you didn't know, there were several gunmen who attacked a concert hall full of people. It was brutal. At this point, more than 140 people killed. It was horrible. And they said that ISIS did that. And I was surprised because I thought that ISIS was from the previous season of the planet Earth. Uh, but actually, the screenwriters are so out of ideas that they were like, OK, let's bring ISIS back, I guess, because uh, we're losing ratings right now. And what's crazy is that these days, whenever a horrible thing happens, Putin tries to connect everything to Ukraine. And I was so curious about how would he connect that attack to Ukraine? And he actually did that. So what he said was, you know, it was ISIS, but, you know, it was Ukraine too, because, you know, they tried to escape to Ukraine. So, you know, Ukraine. <laughs> It was so crazy, and I think that if one day aliens attack Russia, Putin will be like, you know, the aliens, they're green. I mean, you know, as if you mix blue and yellow together, so <laughs> sounds like Ukraine to me. Also, I mean, come on, you know, Zelensky, so. <laughs> It's, by the way, uh, my favorite joke of the whole show, because to understand that one, uh, you need to know both English and Russian. And I feel so embarrassed in front of people who didn't get that joke. And I'm going to embarrass myself even more uh, by explaining that one right now. So. You know what? You know what? You're so supportive and so welcoming. And I know that it must be hard to see a comedian performing in their second language, but I want you to know that I'm very grateful and your sacrifice tonight uh, will not be forgotten. And I want you to know that I'm so grateful that I want to promise to you right now to thank you since I have all your emails and telephone numbers and all your data. I want to promise to you right now that if I ever become an international superstar, I will find each one of you and I will buy each one of you a house in Hollywood. Just to thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. Oh my God, thank you. You know what? Two houses for everybody in Hollywood. Yes, yes. Oh my God, that's very interesting because uh, I usually do that joke when people start clapping and then I promise a house and they clap even louder and I promise another house. And what usually happens is that people keep on clapping and I promise a car and then an airplane and then a boat and, and I keep and keep promising a bunch of property. But you're actually the first audience during the tour that stopped clapping after <laughs> the second house because you're so humble because 
you were like, that's enough. Yeah, we don't need anything more. We are fine with just two houses. We don't want to make you go bankrupt because of us. And I imagine that when I actually become an international superstar and we will live in Hollywood together with all the people from different countries where I perform and everybody will have several houses and castles and cars, boats, airplanes, and then they will be like, and who's these humble people with only two houses? Oh, that's the humble audience from Berlin. Yeah, they already have everything. They don't need more. Or they just didn't know that you you could keep on clapping to get promised more crazy property in the future, yeah. So basically, the last name, Zelensky, uh, sounds similar to a Russian word for uh, green, which is Zeloni, so let's just move on, I guess. I'm sorry for wasting your time on that horrible educational part, so. Another joke that I want to tell is uh, about the recent murder of Alexei Navalny, who was a big figure in the Russian opposition. And it was quite personal and emotional for me, uh, not only because I was a supporter, but also, if you didn't know, I, I actually worked for Navalny for a while. After the war started, I found a job on one of his YouTube channels as a host of a satirical show about the war, which was actually my second and last job in my my life, and if you're interested, my first job I had 10 years ago, when I started out as a comedian, I found a job as a cashier uh, at Cinnabon. Do you know Cinnabon? They do Cinnamon Rolls. So these are the only two jobs that I had in my life. Uh, 10 years ago, I was a cashier at Cinnabon. Uh, then I had uh, a 10-year gap of having no official job. <laughs> 10 years after, a host of my own satirical show about the war. So my CV... <laughs> Uh, looks weird as fuck. <laughs> it looks as if I didn't like to be a cashier so much <laughs> that I decided to change my life strategy drastically after that. Mm. And also, I was just 19 years old. I didn't know how to even quit a job properly. I was convinced that you quit a job if you just stop going there. <laughs> So after a week of being a cashier, I got so exhausted that I decided to quit and I just stopped going there. <laughs> and they were calling me every day, where are you? And I was like, didn't you hear the news? <laughs> I quit, what? You have to come and do your job? And I was like, no. And they were like, we have your salary. And I was like, I'm coming right away. <laughs> I think that my problem is that uh, since I come from an abusive family, I have a delayed emotional response. So whenever a horrible thing happens, I feel in control for a while, and it's only with time when I start feeling emotions and I become sentimental. And then suddenly I break down completely and I cannot predict when it happens because you want it to be beautiful like in movies, you know, when you're alone at your apartment, you're looking through the window, it's raining, and a candle is burning, you're listening to your favorite music, thinking about that person that is gone forever, and with that person are gone, all the hopes and dreams connected to that person. That's how you want it to be, but unfortunately, it was not how it happened to me. So what I'm about to tell is gonna be quite embarrassing and dirty, but it's still an important memory for me. So the moment I finally broke down and uh, if I could expect that, I would prepare better. But just by coincidence, that was the day of his funeral. And that whole day, I was on my way from Belgium to Berlin to have a day off during the tour. And that trip took the whole day. First, I went to an airport in Brussels, then on a plane to Berlin, then on a train to my apartment in Berlin. And all that day, I was watching these videos from the funeral of people mourning and crying and chanting and videos videos of him being buried and photos of him in a coffin and I felt already emotional and what was weird was that people in Belgium around me they didn't care about that and I don't blame them because they live in a different context they have their own problems such as uh, how can we eat all the chocolate that we produce that's very tough for <laughs> Belgians as well you cannot blame them and then finally, late at night, I got home, and that was the moment it finally hit me, and that was very embarrassing, but still important. So 
I was on my toilet and I was having a massive shit. And uh, I was completely naked because shortly before that, I jerked off and I came on my stomach <laughs> because that's how I deal with stress. And after I came, I needed energy. So I was shitting and covered with cum and eating a waffle at the same time. <laughs> And then, all of a sudden, I started fucking crying and sobbing, and I couldn't control that anymore, and that was so embarrassing, and I immediately realized that I would remember that for the rest of my life, because I do not cry that often. Actually, last time I cried was two years ago when the war started, and I hadn't cried for two years. That was the next moment I cried, so I think I have just five cries left in my life and I didn't know what to do. The first thing I did, I stopped shitting immediately because it was too important for me to continue to be shitting. And I was thinking, okay, what should I do now? Should I stand up to cry properly? Should I put the waffle away? And I did. And I stood up and I put the waffle away and I cried like that and my ass covered with shit and stomach with cum and mouth with waffle and tears and so and I realized that this whole time I was in my toilet and I wanted to rewrite that horrible memory to make it more proper so I ran to my only room to cry there more beautifully and the problem was that I have this huge as fucking windows with no curtains so my neighbors across the street definitely saw that miserable fucking person jerking off and shitting and eating a waffle and crying at the same time then running to their only room to cry there properly and trying to sit on a chair realizing that their ass is still covered with shit standing up again so I took a shower and I dressed up accordingly and I finally sat at the table and I was looking through the window, it was raining and the candle was burning and I was listening to my favorite music, thinking about that person that was gone forever and with that person were gone, all the hopes and dreams connected to that person and that uh, did not help. So now I have this important but still dirty, embarrassing memory that I cannot share with people and people are asking each other what did you do that day oh me I went to the Russian embassy with flowers to show them that I remember their crimes and me I went to the funeral itself it was dangerous but important for me to do so and what about you Sasha <laughs> and I'm like can I have this waffle over there please <laughs> And it's a very embarrassing story. And what's even more embarrassing is that uh, there is no strong punchline to finish that story. So it always ends awkwardly in silence. And I think the reason is that it's the first horrible event in my life that I lived through completely in English. At this point, there are already days and days when I do not speak Russian anymore. And I only speak English. And I already start thinking in English sometimes. But because of my level of English, the thoughts that I have are very simple and basic. So whenever a horrible thing happens, I'm like, Putin, but, <laughs> and then I switch back to my Russian language and I have this complicated, sophisticated literature thoughts and my English self is like, smart. <laughs> Russian, smart. Also, I recently, I learned a new term, and the term is a, a champagne socialist. It means a rich person who supports socialism. So I think that I might call myself a uh, Fritz Kohler anarchist. <laughs> and to describe my life, I basically escaped vodka fascists. Uh, to live among schnapps liberals, that's my life described using drinks and political stances. <laughs> I think that my problem when educating myself is that I get too snobby way too quickly. Like, it was recently the second anniversary of the full-scale invasion in Ukraine, and I went to an anarchist demonstration in support of Ukraine. And I knew that anarchists, they have black flags, but when I got to the demonstration, I saw a flag that I hadn't seen before. It was a black and pink flag, and I didn't know about that flag. That was the moment I learned about that flag, and I hadn't known.
known anything about that flag before. So I asked the person nearby, what's that flag? And they said that a black and pink flag stands for queer anarchism. That was the moment I learned about that. I hadn't known about that before. But it took me just a couple of minutes to see a group of old ladies passing by and they stopped near the demonstration and I heard them saying clearly in Russian, pointing at that flag, what's that flag? And immediately I was like, oh my fucking God. <laughs> That's literally queer anarchism. Okay, old ladies? Educate yourself, please. <laughs> or go back to Dresden, all right? I think it's hard to be a leftist in Germany because, of course, I support workers and labor rights, but you guys, you have so many strikes in Germany that it really affects my life in a horrible way. So I have mixed feelings about that. Uh, I think that to be a leftist in Germany, it's like BDSM, you know, <laughs> because you support them workers and then your train gets canceled all of a sudden because of a strike and your day is fucking ruined and you're like, let's go workers, yes! Yes, more of that, please, yes! Go and fight for your rights, workers, don't worry about me! I will walk to Frankfurt on my feet just to show you my solidarity with you. So I have another joke uh, that it's necessary to give you the context before telling that one. So uh, one of the biggest uh, anarchist philosophers is, uh, his name is uh, Pyotr Kropotkin. Pyotr Kropotkin. So now I'm gonna do a joke about queer anarchism using that context. So here we go. <clears throat> I mean, queer, eh? you have to start with I mean, because to sound more casual. <laughs> I mean, queer anarchism, what's that? Uh, who's the founder of that ideology? Uh, Piotr Krop Topkin? <laughs> okay, the show is almost over, and uh, just like my career, I guess. And I'm very sorry for uh, so many jokes about uh, Russian things, but I hope that I will get rid of them with time. So <laughs> bear with me for 10 more years, please. <laughs> So I recently came up with a metaphor uh, about how it feels to have a Russian passport these days. And my metaphor is that it feels as if you're participating in some kind of a cruel and sophisticated prank uh, where bullies caught you after school and they took away your real documents. And instead of that, they gave you a steaming pile of horseshit. <laughs> And they told you to try crossing borders with that, just to make fun of you. So now, every time you're in a queue near a border control, you have to shamefully put your hand down the pocket to take out the steaming pile of horseshit, and you want to hold it closer to your chest for people not to see that you have a steaming pile of horseshit. But people, you know, they still can feel the smell, so. You come up to the counter and you put the steaming pile of horseshit on the counter and the officer doesn't even want to touch it. And I think that's why they always ask you, do you have residence permit? And you're like, nah, I only have visa. Try searching inside of this pile of horseshit. So they have to put their hand down the pile to find your shitty visa. And finally they find one and they're like, is that the one? And you're like, no, that one expired 10 years ago. Try searching deeper. Yeah, 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 that's the one. Comedian, that's me. Okay. So now uh, we are almost done with the show and I want to thank you for coming and uh, I appreciate that and much appreciate it and uh, it means the world to me. Do you need napkins? Sorry. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh,
Give a round of applause for this wonderful venue and the workers. Yeah, we're so excited to be here tonight. And yeah, so basically if you want to take a picture after the show or to have a small talk, we can do it outside in any convenient language. But just in case, I know only two. And <laughs> I'm speaking one right now. But feel free to speak, like if you speak uh, Ukrainian or Belarusian, we can do that so you can speak and I'll be like, uh-huh, 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 Kalilatka, uh-huh. Let's move on, sorry. <laughs> okay, okay, so, all right. So, uh, I'm about to do the closing bits and I put the stand like that because that's what comedians do when they're closing. So now you understand that I am about to close the show and I will put that aside so <laughs> it takes up so much space. <laughs> so I am non-binary and I feel weird about being non-binary in English because I speak of myself in the feminine gender which is easier in Russian because Russian is uh, very gendered. So basically every word in Russian is gendered. And since I speak of myself in a feminine gender, I don't have to mention that I am non-binary separately. People just understand that from the way I pronounce every word in the feminine gender. But in English, you can talk for hours and people still won't get an idea about your gender. So there is no natural way in English to let people know about your gender. And you know, they say that in different languages you have different personalities. And I think that's true. And I think that my personality in English is way more annoying than my personality in Russian. <laughs> because it's in English that I have at some point to stop every conversation to say, by the way, <laughs> just so you know, I am non-binary, okay? <laughs> and people are like, okay. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> now, about your residence permit. <laughs> Do you use fax, by the way? <laughs> and also, can you ask that kid to stop saying Aina Chocolada bit because that's the only phrase they know. Because that's the only phrase you know. And that's the only phrase you can use during the show. <laughs> Recently, I had a show in Amsterdam, and everybody was on mushrooms. And uh, after that joke, I lost them completely. Yeah, that was too multidimensional for this audience. <laughs> so uh, sometimes people ask me if I have gender dysphoria as a non-binary person. My answer is that I had it more before I came out because all my life I used to look at myself in the mirror thinking, well, that doesn't look masculine at all, you know? I have this weird thin hands, this giant head, you know? And also this voice, I have this voice all my life as if uh, three aliens are speaking at the same time <laughs> from different directions. <laughs> Where are they? And now after I came out, it's easier because I look at myself in the mirror thinking, okay, that explains everything. <laughs> that looks quite vague. <laughs> Sometimes even people validate me randomly on the street. Sometimes people approach me from behind and they're like, excuse me, ma'am. And they don't understand that they've just validated me quite much. So I turn to them like that. <laughs> And they're like, oh, sorry, sir. <laughs> and I'm like, no, it's OK. <laughs> I can be ma'am. <laughs> and they don't understand that they've just validated me. So they're just thinking that I'm just being way too polite and nice to them. <laughs> no, it's OK. I can be ma'am. <laughs> what? A blowjob next time. <laughs> sorry, not tonight. <laughs> but I can give you five cigarettes at the same time, it's not like that. <laughs> so, and um, the last one is, uh, the weirdest thing for me is that uh, 
back home, we had a lot of anti-European propaganda saying that pretty much everybody in Europe is queer. And basically everything that you do here, you just go to the sandless gay parades, having sex with each other on the streets, naked, wearing only leather underpants. <laughs> And whenever my family was watching that propaganda on Russian TV, they were horrified. Oh, God! Luckily, our traditional values are under protection here in Russia. <laughs> but I always felt different, so whenever I was watching that, I was like, uh, oh, God! I have to go there. <laughs> That's the place where I belong. <laughs> and I moved to Europe, and it turned out that it was a lie. <laughs> I mean, for sure, here are some uh, gay and trans people, but not like everyone. <laughs> so to be honest, I'm furious about that. <laughs> so now, whenever I see this fucking, this hetero uh, fucking couples, <laughs> is there fucking, says hetero infant. <laughs> Fucking babies. <laughs> I feel outraged by this bullshit. <laughs> so I'm thinking that to me, uh, Russian propaganda uh, is false advertising. That's what it is. <laughs> and my plan now is to sue Europe <laughs> uh, for being not queer enough. Thank you very much. That's been my time. Thank you for coming. Have a good night. Bye.